Hello everybody, buongiorno from Italy, from Florence, Italy. I'm Bianca Valerio and we're taking you on a walking tour around Florence. More than 2,000 years ago, it was actually called Florentia. During those times, Latin was also uh, a language that they used. So of course, all these names just sort of like evolved through time from Florentia, it became Florentia, and then again Firenze, and to us English speakers, it is Florence. Okay, so now we are here in Bottega Strozzi. So I was mentioning that these buildings used to be houses of like, we're talking billionaires, like really, really rich. Like they would, they were into banking. Uh, they were merchants and all that. So this is a very popular, I guess, house, or in this case, it's called Bottega Strozzi. Uh, here's a little fun fact. So we all know from a fashion point of view, and even if you're not in fashion, you, we've all heard of the brand Bottega Veneta. Well, the locals actually kind of uh, kind of find it funny that it's called Bottega because Bottega actually means shop in uh, Italian or in English. And specifically, we're not talking like a bougie type of store. We're actually saying like Bottega, like a little mom and pop shop, like a, almost like to us Filipinos, like a sari sari store, like a convenience store. So when you say Bottega Veneta to them, it's weird it's kind of funny okay so we're here now in this courtyard or formerly owned by the strozzi family and you can see up there like it's just absolutely huge from the inside nowadays it's actually being used as like an art gallery like right now there's actually an exhibition for uh, yam pei ming painting history so there's actually many different types of art shows that are you know temporary they have their own like uh, weeks or seasons or whatnot that you guys can check out here Bottega Strozzi okay so we are on our the first stop was uh, Bottega Strozzi and then our second stop is this very famous church right here is a Santa Maria Novella okay so this church over here really really famous it's actually run by the Dominican monk. So what's very interesting to me is this is the very first representation of the Renaissance. This, uh, this over here, like it kind of looks like a house, right? You know, the Romans actually uh, believed they were pagans. So this style over here, sorry, this house is supposed to be inspired of that style back then, something that is in relation to paganism. But the more interesting thing to me is you see these two little designs over here. If you take a look at this church, it's so symmetrical, like everything is so perfectly balanced. And that's what makes this church such a masterpiece in terms of art. So these two things right here, is the very first kind of its design. So the artist decided, since we have this uh, tower right here in the middle, he wanted to do some kind of design to make it more balanced in relation to the bottom. So he designed those curves to the side right there. And if you think about it, so many churches or maybe even houses are even built with this style up to today. So now from Santa Maria Novella, we are going to take a step inside one of the first or the first pharmacy in all of Europe. So just a little backstory. You know how there is a lot of churches, a lot of abbeys, or just a lot of different orders. Like for example, uh, I, how can I forget the ones in Baguio, um, Baguio City in the Philippines where they sell their uber jams, their very famous uber and strawberry jams. You know, all these different uh, groups with nuns and priests, they have to find a way to make a living, of course, to help sustain themselves, right? And uh, during back, uh, back, back in those times of the Dominican friars, they also had a pharmacy. But nowadays, this has become a perfume just take a look at the outside it's absolutely stunning and the ceiling is just really how it welcomes you with all the dried flowers just to let you know what you're in for a treat in fact the smell is just really invigorating 
Um, I believe it is the oldest pharmacy, if not in Europe, in all of Rome. I believe it's the oldest pharmacy in Europe. Stunning. So you see these roses over here, right? They're dried roses. So the very first product that uh, Santa Maria Novella Pharmacy actually made was uh, rose water. We know rose water today as like cologne. Um, you can even find it in chocolates and food. But back then it was actually used to wash your hands. Another historical thing that you're going to find inside the store is the very first bottle over there, there's like a whole line of so many bottles, perfumes, and colognes that you can choose from. It is the one in the corner where Mrs. Medici, they're like one of the most powerful historical families in all of Florence. She married the King of France and she actually had a custom, custom made bottle of cologne made for her husband. At that time, the branding was actually Santa Maria Novella, but now it's actually called Aqua Something Reina, which means the queen's water, because she was queen. So I'm actually going to take a whiff of the one from uh, Mrs. Medici. It's quite strong. I'm, I'm honestly surprised it's for a man because it's quite floral bougie perfume <laughs> oh my goodness this is stunning i was not prepared this is beautiful i didn't expect this and i'm actually wearing a garden dress as well wow so the name of this like um, art experience right now is So if I'm in a walking tour, these folks over here, all of them are in one big walking tour. So I'm gonna get out of the way. Why don't I take you back? It's happy hour, but 300 years ago. Okay, so you could actually purchase wine from probably a vineyard owned by the family who owned this building. And uh, you could get it right here. Vino window, window for wine like it and now we are actually approaching the duomo so that's the bell tower that's the duomo or cathedral so this is the baptistry and this is the residence of the archbishop or the cardinal i actually learned that the baptistry is a, is a place where um, people would get baptized I didn't even know there was such a thing, that it was like a separate building. This is actually the oldest building in all of Florence. And it was really, really important because when we think of religion, I know they always say that religion and state are two separate things. Um, not really. Back in those days, to be baptized was such a sacred, special, almost like necessary thing. Why? In order for you to be a citizen, you would need to be baptized. Isn't that crazy? I mean, nowadays there are so many people who roam around the world, roam around the streets, who are Christian, who are Catholic or whatnot, and they're not baptized. But back then, in, um, in terms of Christianity, in order for you to be a citizen, which is a very political move, you would have to be baptized. And that's why they had a separate building just for that ceremony. Continuing with all this information, so right behind me is the Duomo. Now, I know everybody is fascinated by the Duomo, as stunning as she is, but uh, right across her is this uh, beautiful golden door. The name of the artist is Lorenzo Ghiberti, okay? So we're thinking like 1458 when this was actually finished. I believe it took him 25 years to finish. Not because he was lazy or whatnot, it's because back at that time, we, you know this was like the start of the Renaissance a lot of artists they were doing so many things and I think with an artist you know how they say you should never rush an artist um, art should never be rushed so uh, this door although not the original because the original is now in the museum 
25 years later, when Michelangelo had actually seen this, he was just so fascinated by it that he actually said, you know what, this door is so stunning, it is so innovative, it is just captivating, it should be called the doors to paradise or the doors to heaven. Hence, the Porto de Paradiso. Now, if you take a closer look at the doors, there's only 10 panels as opposed to the other doors where actually they had more panels in it. Now, if you think of a photo, just think of a photo. The larger the photo is, you can get even more details into it, right? And the same thing over here. So with each panel, you can actually see the depth of the different details of not just the thing at the front, but even in the background. Now, what is the innovation behind these photos? Now, they're actually, they're 3D and in metal. So imagine in 1400s, for them to create the 3D effect has to do with mathematical, geometric accuracy, which is something apparently that Michelangelo never even mastered himself, which makes the artist just incredibly like amazing. So his portrait, or I guess his carving or sculpture is actually right there. He's the bald guy. And then opposite him is um, his son. Amazing. She is my personal Duomo of them all. Why wouldn't it be? She is truly stunning, right? So this is the Duomo of Florence. It's Santa Maria del Fiore or Mary of the Flowers and truly blooming against that light. This is the largest cathedral in all of Italy and the third largest in the world. Do we all know Dante, folks? Dante, you know Dante's Inferno? Yeah. So he was actually Florentine. They can't exactly say where he was born, although he was born, as we're going through the walking tour, somewhere in this neighborhood. So this church uh, was from 1030, the year 1030, 200 years before uh, Dante was born. So they were actually sure that Dante must have gone to church at this church over here. So we're moving forward. Many years later, after Dante had died, they had decided to erect this building right behind me, although it is not exactly Dante's house, but they can assume that if he didn't live here, it was somewhere in this neighborhood. So just like in the Philippines, we have Tagalog, which is our local language. But then in many, many provinces, there are dialects. And one dialect in Italy is Tuscan. So as we all know that Dante is a writer, and he was one of those writers that actually wanted to write Inferno in Tuscan. And this was so revolutionary because it was in his native tongue, in this case, his dialect. And so because of that, other writers then started to become more courageous in writing, not just in Italian, but also in their, in, in Tuscan, in which was considered a very vulgar language. It wasn't as refined as Italian. It was such a coincidence because we are walking from Dante's uh, little corner, if you will, and uh, you know we are kind of getting tired and we needed a drink. And little did we know that just around the corner, it led us to Giardino 25 by Gucci. Okay, so we all know that movement, um, know the plastic, you know, they use lesser plastics, save the environment. So here in Florence, this is not some new invention. Like right behind me, it's been going on for, for several years now where people could actually load their own bottles, where you can see there's two taps, one and two. You can choose between still and sparkling. Isn't that, like I have to buy my own machine to make sparkling water, but damn Florence. Okay, do you see this? This is gasata which means gas, like con gas, uh, sparkling. Oh my God, we're gonna get it on our, how do you turn this on? So you push and you, oh, oh, cause it's sweating like my hand. Guys. You come back with a bottle, it's better. 
We're trying, we're trying, folks. Oh. So we're gonna take off the hats. Give me a second. Okay. For vlog's sake, wow, that is super refreshing. Very cold, very chill. It is really sparkling. <laughs> I show you another thing. You have to see. This. Oh my god, that was sparkling water. So how you do? You twist this, and how do you do? You ha put the mouth there. Oh. No. No, you put the hand here. Oh. Oh my god, could you do that again? <laughs> you put. You twist. You put the hand here. Oh my god, that is so cool. So if over there was a more modern, literally like mineral water, this on the other hand, I've actually seen this all over Italy. You'll find this in a lot of places, but I never knew how you could drink from it. And thank you, Francesco. Now you know, you don't have to go like this to the side like me. And if you're wearing a hat, you're screwed. So you put your hand on the thing and voila, it goes another direction. That was probably the best thing I learned on tour today. <laughs> and after Gucci, the beautiful Gucci, we're here in the most famous piazza in all of Florence, Piazza de Signorina. If I got it wrong, Signorina kind of means like a, a girl or a Signorina, right? Okay, so this round circle over here is pretty popular. Honestly, when we've been here before, we never really minded it, or at least I didn't, but my sister did, but we never really knew the history. So it actually, he says here in the inscription, I'm gonna make this a super shortcut version, but this name of over here, FRA, which is short for Friar. Girolamo Savonarola. So this guy. Okay. So just think. The Medici family, they were a very, very powerful, powerful aristocratic family. Because of all that power, you know, a lot of people were not happy about that. Until this guy, this friar, comes into the scene. So he was this person that it would fill this whole piazza of him talking. Right? So it was almost like he was like a religious revolutionary. And he started to preach, you know, preach things like Jesus is coming and he has chosen Florence. That Jesus Christ has chosen Florence. And because Jesus Christ has chosen Florence, we need to purify all of Florence. So, of course, he took advantage of a very vulnerable situation. The people were in dire need of a new leader of sorts to save them, so, uh, so to speak, from the aristocratic power. And that's exactly what he did. But because he was very um, extreme, so this friar, he would go around Florence and he would like ransack different houses and he would like remove like mirrors or any, um, any items that um, symbolize vanity because he wanted to, you know, purify people with, I guess, vows of poverty and purity and all these things. And then eventually right here, he was um, burned at the stake. Yeah, I guess people were just like pretty much fed up because he was just too, too extreme. This piazza is like super, super famous, and not just because it's the center part of, of, of town, but also because of all the statues that are just found all around. Now, these statues all came here at different uh, times in, in, in centuries and in years and all that, right? And they were also transferred at one point to another. Now, this guy over here, that's Poseidon, god of the sea. We all know him, Little Mermaid moment. Okay, this one over here is a lion. So the lion is actually the symbol of Florence. Did you know that? No, I didn't, now I do. Okay, but the most famous statue will probably have to be, at least in my opinion, is this guy over here. That is David by Michelangelo. And that is uh, Hercules, this one. This is Hercules by, I forgot who artist. So this is Ponte Vecchio. Ponte means bridge, Vecchio means old, so old bridge. And uh, in relation to old rich, you're going to find some of the most expensive 
uh, shops that are on this bridge. Every time I come here to Florence, it's always closed by the time I get here. But you guys get the picture. You know, we've got like Vacheron Constantine, all these other luxury brands, so on and so forth. You get the picture. So other than Ponte Vecchio, the one bridge that Florence is really, really known for is Santa Finita. Although if you think about it, it's actually quite simple on the top and you can see more of its detail from Ponte Vecchio. But what makes it actually quite interesting is what's underneath the bridge or its design. So um, the curve that you see like underneath the bridge, that is actually the very first bridge in the world to actually have the shape of that uh, elliptical, if you can see. Yeah, that elliptical shape. So actually all the bridges um, in Florence were destroyed in 1944. Um, as to the reason, I don't really know why. However, they decided not to do that to this baby. They wanted to retain her. Yeah, so she is just like, uh, um, I think I got that right. Uh, either they didn't destroy her and retained her and restored her, or they destroyed everything but then they made a copy of her onto what she looked like from before it was one of those two but the point is whether she is an original or not this is um, a landmark of florence not just from the top but especially from the bottom too. We had done all this research of trying to find the best restaurant to, to go to for dinner. And in the end, we end up at our hotel. But you know what, that's okay because our hotel happens to be the oldest hotel in all of Italy, dating back to the 13th century. Before the pandemic, apparently this hotel, uh, this five-star hotel was known for this restaurant in particular because it served the best Best truffle based dishes right so anything truffle they served it here unfortunately during the pandemic this closed and then now it is now open with a new chef is still incorporating some of those truffle dishes but of course with a mix of other new things I'm gonna try first my tortellini pasta tortellini is like this pasta that it looks like a pouch and it has stuffing inside and this one i believe has pomodoro that green stuff is like basil oil mm. actually it doesn't feel heavy the pasta is al dente it has that sweet and tanginess from the tomato and a little bit of that herby freshness from the basil and then the cream i was expecting it to be like i i believe it's like a burrata a burrata mm -hmm. sauce so i'm expecting it to be like super rich and and just um too luxurious too rich but no this is actually it's still light and frothy and um delicious <laughs> <laughs> 